If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13. If you don't have your Bibles, it will be exceedingly difficult for you to turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Um, this is the um, one of the, the best writings on what love is that you will find anywhere. In fact, it's the best. Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, again, I pray. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you teach us through your word, that your, through your spirit, using your word, even beyond my words, the words of any teacher, you speak and teach each person. So may we have a rich time with you this day. Through Christ I pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13 is called the love chapter of the Bible. I one time read a book when I was in college that speculated what would Christians be like if every Christian every day would read 1 Corinthians 13 and put it into practice. How different would our lives be? How different would the churches be? How different would the world be if we would just read this every day? Now, we've not read this every day devotionally, but this is one of those passages that I think I need to keep coming back to regularly because it's just a really good... Every time I read it, I feel challenged and encouraged and ugh, I'm so glad that I've read it in, in every way. So, 1 Corinthians 13 begins, actually, there's a phrase in the last chapter of, uh, last verse of chapter 12, which says, and now I want to show you a better way, the Apostle Paul says. And he starts talking about love, and he begins by saying what love isn't. He says, if I speak human or angelic tongues, but I do not have, have love, I am a gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, talk is cheap. If all I do is talk... Love is not talk. Love is not beautiful sayings. Love is not hollow, elegant promises. Love is more than that. It's action and attitude. Verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith that can move mountains, but don't have love, I'm nothing. In other words, uh, love is not a great ability to preach. Love, and I'm thankful for that. Love is not even great faith. You may be a miracle worker who does great things you believe in the name of Jesus. You may spend your whole life working in the church, doing great and miraculous things. But Paul says, if at the heart of that, it's not love, it's nothing. And love is not sacrifice alone either. Verse 3, if I give away all my possessions and I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. All of us have made sacrifices for the wrong reasons. We've served with bad attitudes. And I hate to say it, but Paul says, it's nothing. I remember when I was a kid in high school, I think it was, my mom told me I needed to go weed the garden and out back, dad's vegetable garden. And I remember being out there and it was a hot day and I didn't want to be out there. I wanted to be playing or something, doing more fun than just, you know, bending over, working the garden kind of thing. And, and, and I remember for some reason, um, God brought this verse to mind. And so as I'm Weeding in the garden for with bad attitude. I'm thinking, you know, I guess the Bible says, you know, I can sacrifice myself completely, but if it's not love, I guess that means I can like pull the weeds. I can do a perfect job manicuring the lawn, but if I'm doing it out of anger, if I'm doing it out of spite, if I'm doing it with a bad attitude, I don't get credit for it. And I don't want to not get credit for it. Okay, I love my dad. I love my mom, whatever it is. We've all done stuff that we thought was really sacrificial, but we did it for selfish reasons. And that's not love. Paul says it's, not, it's empty. It's worthless. Dang. Um, what is love? Verse 4. Just kind of let these wash over. Love is patient. Love is long-suffering. The picture here literally is somebody punching you and you turn the other cheek. Boy, our world needs that today. Love is kind. Love gives a hug. When was the last time you were accused of being kind? Um, there's a lot of talking about 
about oppression and hurt. You know what? We all need to be a little less defensive. And if somebody has been the victim of oppression, if somebody has been hurt, um, our kindness ought to go out to them. Our empathy is not going to be able to cure them completely, but it is our responsibility. Rather than getting into so many arguments, you know, I heard Thomas Sowell say recently, it is a whole lot easier to get into a war than to get out of a war. And we're headed for wars if people don't determine, I'm going to be kind and understanding. Understand, listen for people's hurts. Love does not envy. Envy is killing our world today, isn't it? And a tendency to say, oh, I'm not envy. I am not envious. The Bible says in James chapter 3, verse 16, where there's envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil practice. I would suggest to you that the reason that there's disorder and every evil practice is directly related to the envy of our day, whether it's the envy for power or the envy for things. There is increased ungodliness and increased envy. Part of the language that people are going to be using in the future and are using now is equity, which is just another word for many people for envy. Hey, if God has called you to be generous, you need to be generous. If God has blessed you, you need to give to others because of love, because of grace. But if you're looking to other people's stuff and saying, they have more than I do, and I can't be happy until I have what they have, until the world is completely fair, and I have what, and everybody gets the everything equity. In a world where so much diversity, it's impossible to ever have equity. We need to treat each other as equal in value. But envy says, I can't be happy until they don't have what they have, or I have what they have. And where you find that, you find disorder in every evil practice. And for there to be peace today, Christians have to be the first to repent of envy, and then to have the boldness and character to call other people to repent of their envy as well, because it'll never satisfy, it just brings disorder. The result is always evil and disorder. Love is not boastful. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. How much rudeness is justified today? Um, if you are a business person, it's really easy to be rude. If, if you're just kind of like, I just want to get, I just tell it as it is. Well, it's great to be honest, but we're supposed to speak the truth in love. And one of the things that God's convicted me of recently is, Brett, you can just be rude sometimes and unthoughtful. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. Now, we could stop there for a year, couldn't we? What happens when I'm self-seeking? Ugh. I'll tell you what happens. Love is not irritable. I get irritable. Love does not keep records of wrongs. Again, we live in an age that because of our selfishness, we feel entitled to our irritability and anger and entitled to keep a record of wrongs. I'm not saying this because I have some other agenda than for people to love and to be like Christ and to know the peace of Christ. But love keeps no record of wrongs. See, that's hard. It takes a sacrifice to burn the records of wrongs that have been done against you. It's a lot easier to hold on to the hurts. Again, if you have done hurt to somebody else, if you see somebody else who's hurting, you had better be compassionate. You had better listen. You had better take responsibility for the hurt that you have caused. But if you have been hurt, seeking vengeance for that hurt will not bring you peace. It's not loving. Love is not irritable. keeps no record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness. Are you planning unrighteousness? Do you think you're going to find joy in pursuing disobedience to God? God has said, do this, do this, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. He has shown us his righteous way. Do you really think that you're going to find joy in unrighteousness? Love doesn't try. Because we love God too much. And then we love people too. Love rejoices in the truth. In other words, love doesn't gossip. 
Love doesn't spread gossip or things that are not true. Um, I think love would have a hard time on Facebook and Twitter sometimes. Do you rejoice in the truth or do you rejoice when people, when bad things are said about people that you don't like and whether they're true or not, you hope that they are true? Do you rejoice? Do you kind of like it when people say things that may not be true about somebody? When the facts are not all out, but because it fits a narrative that you like, you rejoice. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. It rejoices in truth. So it's always seeking facts and truth. So love bears all things. Believes all things. There is a gullibility to love. There's a sanctified gullibility to love. That's a hard one, isn't it? Because it makes you vulnerable. Love hopes all things. Are you filled with hope? Do you look at the day, do you look at Christ and you feel hopeful? Love endures all things. Love never ends or love never fails. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for knowledge, they'll come to an end. There comes a time when everything that's terminal will be terminated. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish things aside. Boy, I, I, when I was a child, I used to think there's going to come a time when I put childish things aside. Now that I'm a man, there are there's still lots of childish things I haven't put aside. For now we, only, we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we'll see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. But these three great things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Why does Paul here say love is the greatest? I think, first of all, because love is God. Dear friends, John says in 1 John 4, 7, love one another because love is from God. Everybody who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. He sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Why is love the greatest? Because you can have faith without love. You can have hope without love, but I guess you just can't have love without love. And love is from God. God is love. Love is also greatest because it's the greatest commandment. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he gave two, not one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, all the scriptures communicate one thing, how to love God and how to love people. When you love your child, when you love your spouse, when you love your coworker, when you love your enemy, you're doing it the greatest. How do you hear God speak to you today? First of all, I hope it reminds you of his great love for you. You could read back through 1 Corinthians 13 and say, God is patient and kind. He's all these things toward you and me. Do you need his love? The measure of love, by the way, is not is not how we love the easiest people to love, though. I would just remind you of that. I hope this day you'll go out and you'll love people better. You'll hear God speak to you and you'll, and his voice will come to you when you're need to be challenged to love. But the real challenge to love is not the people who are most lovable. It's not loving Pat Ferguson, quite frankly. It's loving the people that you don't want to love. The people who are hardest to love. The people who are angry and hostile toward you, the people you disagree with, the people you want to disassociate with. But love is the greatest. Love never fails. And we love because he first loved us. Heavenly Father, 
Help us to love as you have loved us. May your love be made complete in us until that day when we see you face to face when we will really know love like we've never known before. It's through Christ we pray these things. Amen. Um, thanks again for participating. I hope you'll pray for us, pray for the church, and I hope you'll invite somebody to join us to worship in, in worship on Sunday morning. Have a great day.